So I wanted to kind of show, because my work seems to be completely like how does this person do this work, and then do this work, and then do this work. I thought maybe it'd be kind of neat to show you like the progression from 2001 when I first came to Columbus and showed my first set of, uh, started working uh, in this space and show how each work evolved to the next work in a logical progression. Like, you know, I'm all about physics and math, and I, you know, for me it's very clear, but sometimes it's not very clear to, you know, to people looking at the end result. So, but if you were in my studio, which I brought today, <laughs> all over the table, some of the stuff at the bottom, you know, in the, in the basement, uh, you would you would kind of see how I play in the studio and also how the work kind of uh, is created. So let's start. So, uh, what kind of artist am I? Well, again, I have the background in math and physics, uh, and MFA in new media, and I love working with computers. I've been doing that since I was a teenager in the old TRS-80 days. Uh, and uh, the kind of work I do, I think I call myself a maker instead of like an artist. I mean, there's different. I feel like there's different ways of exploring the art community and. Myself, I really love the materials. I love exploring what the materials can do or what they can communicate. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like I am a maker. That's, you know, I feel like that's where I am. Um, let's see, going the right direction. The type of work I do is, is really process-based. I really kind of explore either uh, ideas or uh, rules or uh, whatever it is that comes to my mind when I'm sleeping or mostly in the shower, and then I will iterate or do it over and over again. And I'll try to perfect it. I'll allow all those failures to combine or culminate into something successful. I like thinking about objects uh, as you know as forms of a ways of communicating uh, something outside of what they are. So I, I might you know some of the artists that I really love are Tom Friedman or Chair Donovan or Gogo Su. And all these artists kind of use like the form, but they use it outside of what its its kind of natural uh, idea is. But it's still informing the new work. And for me, I think I think of that too. Um, and I love to explore. I love to play. And so you'll see some of my studio today. You can see it's a setup for it's just like a giant kids playground with lots of like stuff that could cut your hand off or burn you or blind you or acid or everything else. Uh, rules. I love rules. I mean, not like kind of rules that like stop you from doing things, but the kind of rules that actually allow you to have a framework in which to like push the boundaries, right? Um, to me, it's all about process again. So uh, the rules kind of help. Like some of the pieces that I have, and I'll talk about later, are completely rules based. So the rule is the art. And uh, the last solo show I had, I tried to, to use that idea. So those of you who came to see that show, which was what color does the letter Z make, um, that was the rules were the work, and the work on the wall was just the just kind of whatever's left over after you you go through those rules. It's a little bit like a Damien Hirst who has a dot painting rule. The rule is the set of rules that Damien Hirst made are the is the art, and therefore he can give it to a factory and have that have those things made. So. A lot of things, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, how did you come up with this idea? How did you make this? I mean, a lot of the work I've done has been, I mean, especially artists, even in the past when I was a painter, people would say, okay, well, how did you do this? This is incredible, or like, it's really technically done, or old master's technique. I mean, for me, it's, it, it is, I do love making, and I do love the construction of the work, so this is kind of what this talk is going to be about. Um, iterate, um, there's a definition, uh, it's kind of the idea of feedback, and so you will see how each of these works that I made kind of feed back on itself, and the problem that I solved from the work that it needs a problem to be solved kind of leads to a new body of work, which then leads to a new body of work, and that's what this talk should be about. So, starting here, this used to be Gallery 5. Don't show this to Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the kind of work I started out with. Uh, uh, this work is just my, I was a figurative painter, oil on canvas. Uh, I used thousands and thousands of binary prime numbers for the back, backgrounds for some of the works that I did so that my mathematical influence uh, was there. So for me, prime numbers meant something. Uh, they, they kind of like the idea that the prime numbers, as you get bigger in the series, you become less of them. And I think of that as like the ability to make memories. We get older, time seems to compress, and maybe it's because 
we are making memories as if the prime number sequence was the way we make memories. So I would use formulas, I would use these kinds of Fibonacci sequences as metaphor uh, in these paintings. I'm going to go into the next one here. So here's another painting, autumn boundaries, and you can see a lot of the mathematical elements there, the prime knots, uh, some of the, uh, the number pi, the number phi. So again, all these backgrounds from the physics. Um, again, thousands of prime numbers uh, in this piece, right, in the, the backdrop, uh, but these are all done in. And these are really small, like 12 point font that I would substrate. Uh, this is the, the number E, so, and then uh, the corn, kind of E is a, a number that's used in, in growth and decay, it shows so it kind of incorporated in that way. And then I switched, uh, unfortunately for Lynch, he was very angry. A little bit. Uh, I switched to encaustic, right? Because it was so funny. Like, why I switched to encaustic? Well, I'm a painter. I love the surface of paint. I love the control. I love my fan brush. It's my favorite thing. Um, but there's something about encaustic, and if you come up here after the talk, you can actually see what I'm talking about. It's got this ability to be paint. It's the ability to be sculptor. It has the ability to be so many different things, right? Um, and that's what I found really exciting about it. Plus the surface is gorgeous. It's like wax, which is like skin. So it just drew me in and I just wanted to start playing. And so before I move on, I was like, maybe I should tell you what encaustic is. So encaustic is uh, beeswax, which is just wax pellets from bees, which we're having fewer of, that's more expensive. Dimar varnish from trees. You can use heat to melt those together to create this hockey puck called encaustic. Depending on how much varnish to beeswax is harder or softer, and you add then pigments, I use powder pigments, uh, to the mix to create uh, an essence your own paint. Now this is a, 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 a medium that's been around for a long time since the Egyptians, uh, but you know kind of made a, it was you know brought back in with Jasper Johns and his flag. Uh, and although there's, I mean, and there's a big movement within caustics even now, people are starting to use it. It's become a lot, in the last decade, it's become pretty prevalent uh, in the uh, art community. And what do I love about it? And again, I was talking about that these are some of the pangrams I had from a show, the Sherry show, uh, two shows ago, not the last one, but the one before that. Um, and again, you can carve it, you can etch it, you can throw like film in there and collage it. You can cast it um, like into forms, right? It has all these abilities. It's amazing. It's like I love this stuff. <laughs> um, this is a, a detailed shot. I used an actual magnet, magnetic like a magnet in there to create uh, the, uh, the, the lines for the electromagnetic field uh, using uh, iron filings. You can see if you did that fonts, just scratch it, remove it. It just you know it's fantastic. Right. There's some film from our innocent students. And again, casting was really gorgeous. And so this was a show I had here. Uh, it was called Segmentation. I'll probably have a slide for that. Um, but the things that I did not love as a painter, um, you could not achieve some shading, and I could not create photorealistic work. Because you saw the paintings that I was doing were all figurative, right? They were all like, um, and I wanted to do that again. I wanted to embed text. I wanted to do a figure. I wanted to go back to that. And with encaustic, you can't because the way encaustic works is you need a big hot plate, and then it has to, everything has to be melted. And so you take your brush and you put it in this hot melted wax, just like candle wax, and then you put it on the canvas and it just instantly sets. There's no drying, there's nothing else. But you can't blend that. It's pretty much that. So if I had been an impressionist or expressionist, that would have been fantastic, but I was not an impressionist or, you know, I was traditional old master's technique. I would love to, I could blend blue from one corner of the canvas to the other and it was like, you know, my fan brush. So I just tried to figure out, okay, how can I get um, this encaustic to do what I want? Okay. Uh, by the way, this was the first encaustic show I ever had, it was in this gallery, and it was gallery five, it was called segmentation, and you can kind of see some of the elements uh, in the backdrop there. Uh, the one, so I was exploring the idea of what can I do, right? And I had been casting, and this is a piece that kind of, I would say, this is the piece that made the crayon in part. And so I brought it, because it didn't sell. 
Again, this was not very high. <laughs> uh, but this is a piece, and it's composed of you know hundreds and hundreds of little fingers that I cast individually and then melted to the backdrop. So in a lot of ways, if you can think of it, it's a lot like the crayon sticking out, right? Moving out. So to the other end. Um, I mean, I wasn't thinking of crayons at the time, but I knew what encaustic could do, and I was playing with the potential of that medium. Um, so what I did at the time was like, I love computers, and computers were bad at the time, so you actually could see the pixel, right? Not anymore, because I'm being read the display, meaning you can't see pixels, so there are no more pixels. These are the last pixels you'll ever see. Um, anyway, so I thought, okay, I could actually cast these things like the crayon, like the fingers, as little wax mosaic squares, which is what I did, as you can kind of see in the backdrop there. The problem was it looked perfectly, and made a photorealistic image, and it looked perfectly like a mosaic. Like, and so what is the point of using wax when I can just go get glass or something else to make a mosaic? So I was still not happy, although it was a eureka moment, um, but again, it was not what the wax needed to be. And then came Christmas <laughs> with Melody, my God. And uh, I was, uh, that's when I also chopped off my finger. But, um, so, I was building this box for her uh, and putting all these artist materials so that she'd have them in this cute little box in my garage. And I was taking out the crayons and I noticed that, well, I just noticed the crayons, right? And I'm like, wax, mosaic, fingers, <laughs> duh. And I created my first encaustic piece. It's called the Untitled 6500, which is how many crayons it took to actually make this. I had to make everything from scratch. I had to make the molds, I had to make the frame, I had to figure out the process. I had to make the encaustic for this stuff. I had to figure out like how to, to get the image to be photorealistic. I, I just had, it was just like a huge six month thing to create this uh, body, of, to create this one piece. And then I gave it to Art for Life. So, uh, and it's, and to make, to kind of just bring it out into the world because no one had done this before, and I thought it was fantastic because the moment I revealed this to myself in the kitchen, I, I knew that this was just fantastic. I was excited, it was interesting, so um, so I wanted the rest of everyone to see it, so I, I put it up at the auction for Art for Life, uh, where it made a big buzz, if you guys remember it from a long time ago, if you remember that. Yeah? So the, port, the thing on the left is, uh is um, a close-up of a portrait of the portrait on the right. Right, the portrait on the right is the full piece, okay. and then you can see a close-up of the frame. And see, so uh, after that, I have a show here. Uh, this was during the transition for Sherry Gallery. So Sherry Gallery became Sherry Gallery here and took over from Lynn, and she inherited a couple of us artists, right, um, <laughs> along with the building and the lease. So, we kind, of, we kind of came along. And Sherry was delighted to take us on, and so my first real crayon show was with the Sherry Gallery uh, four shows ago. And we, we showed the work, and it was really successful. People loved the work. Um, this, these are the two second earliest works of people I know. Uh, to the left is Arnie, and to the right is Charlie. Uh, both photographs that we had taken of, uh, of colleagues at Denison uh, that were uh, happy once they, you know, once they saw the work. In fact, Charlie actually bought his own piece at the time, which was great because now he, he was at a point where he could afford it. So, so I wanted to take you a little bit into my studio and show you how this is made. So you can, how do you make these? I don't know. Like, so uh, this is me in my studio, right? And I'm working away. And so what I do is I use rice cookers and I make the encaustic medium, which is like I talked to you with the uh, beeswax. And I'll actually mix, mix each of the pigments specifically to the color that is needed for the piece. So when I think of a piece like this banana piece or uh, the lemon piece, what I'll do is I'll take a photograph of that. I'll take, you know, I'll set up a photograph. I'll, I'll reduce the resolution. I'll index the colors, which means I'll be able to catalog exactly what colors are needed where. Yes, it's my physics and math thing, right? Rules. And then uh, I'll actually use these rice cookers to actually mix each of these colors um, by hand, and then I pour them into a bowl. 
This is an example of the molecular module from the C. So, and I can make, uh, this has about 100 grams that I can make at a time. Uh, you can go up to 250 for larger moles that you see there. And that's me continuing to work. <laughs> So, any questions? Or <laughs> How often can you use the molds? How often can you repeat them? Uh, I made these molds about six years ago, and I use them continuously. So these things are great. Mold Max 30 for those artists here, awesome. You should definitely buy that stuff. Uh, what I then do is create the, the frame in which the, the work is uh, done. And I work from the back, because I have my map that tells me what crayons to go where. This is not something that I can do. I use gravity to keep everything in place, just like the, the grocers do with the, the oranges, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, this is another view. This is a Hilton piece that I was making. So the, some of you have stayed at the Hilton or gone there for the uh, great muscles that they have. Uh, you might have seen this piece there. And that's me. Uh, and, and pretty much listening to NPR or audiobooks on tape, at this point in the process, it's very soothing, kind of like painting in oil, it's just kind of like zen. Uh, and I just kind of zen out. And you can kind of see the way uh, the objects are kind of arranged. So each bin has its own number, that kind of thing. So, and it doesn't look like much from the back because everything's kind of janky and in and out. Uh, so, but I rely on the fact that I put in this and put in place some rules, and those rules are going to give me what I need. Uh, this is in my studio, and then so what I do is I'll take the piece and I'll, I'll blow torch the back until it's pure liquid. Uh, at, at which point I will then uh, immerse a piece of wood that's got a uh, stapled uh, aluminum backing, so into the wet molten liquid of wax, so that it all adheres and sticks together as one solid object in the back. With the idea that it holds, you know, it'll be good over time. So that's me just doing stuff in front of my camera. And this is uh, an example of the back actually being melted a little bit more of a close up view. So you can kind of see what I see. And the wax melts through in through the crayons to the water bath that I have it set in. So the water actually protects the tips sometimes. So if you can imagine me working all my butt off like to get these crayons cast to get these things in order, to create all this, and then it comes to the point where I melt it, and it just melts through and destroys it. <laughs> I've got a lot of those too. So, <laughs> and it's, it's really scary, and I, I usually leave this for last. Like, all these things were, like, last two weeks so that I wouldn't freak out, but, like, I, I just could not get to the point where I wanted to melt these, uh, these pieces until the last minute because I was just freaking out because I knew they would probably mess up. Anyway, so that's a little bit of the process. I did this piece uh, just to show you uh, the Melody series, uh, and I sped it up quite a bit just so you can see that you know it actually is being made. But anyway, you'll see the Melody. So those are just stacked. Those aren't into a frame. They're just totally loose until the, the time that they're all melted. So, do you guys have any questions? Any questions? How do you turn that so that you can rock that? Uh, I have it currently on a piece of glass, but normally I have it against a wood panel and it just at an angle, and so everything kind of just gravity. If, Bro, I saw yeah. that on the last one, but this one. This one's on glass. <laughs> okay. And so I put the it's camera pushing up. against glass. Okay. Through. This was supposed to be okay. like, yeah, this is okay. to show you guys. It's me. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> and there's me. You guys have any I have a question. Yeah. Has it ever turned out that your mapping is not, like, that it's come out and you're like, that is not what I expected it to look like? Yeah, well, <laughs> sometimes I forget that everything is backwards. You know how we flip mm -hmm. something? And if I had been putting text or something in, I'd be in big trouble because yeah. every, all the letters would be backwards. Mm -hmm. But luckily, as humans, nobody notices that if everything is well balanced. Yeah. But there are pieces that, like, I'm off. I forgot to flip it, in, you know, in the computer before actually turning it in. And it was, anyway, but nobody knows it. And yeah, there are things that are more successful than others, but because everything is loose, I can still go back in and fix it, which, you know, one pixel at a time. And there's not that many pixels. This one has about 2,000 pixels. So this was a show that I had at Sherry, um, I think it was three years ago? Or not three, three shows ago, maybe it was four years ago. <laughs> okay, that's a bad slide. I don't know how that got in there. That's the slide. 
So what the other problem I had was all those little beautiful details and uh, pieces of information that I used uh, earlier in my paintings, uh, all the formulas, all the text, DNA, gene, uh, genome sequencing, all that, I wanted to put those in there too. So I'm like, well, how do I, how do I put text into these things now that I've created this crayon thing? Well, I could put the letter T and it would be about this big, or I could actually go T and it still would be about that big. So I had to come up with an idea of like, how can I actually do this? And what I did have, know I had control over because I make the crayons myself, and I know where each crayon is gonna be ahead of time, I knew color and I knew location. So using that, I came up with the idea of a color alphabet. And so I went online to go get the standard color alphabet that should be out there. Those, those of you who are in electronics know that there's a standard color set for resistors, right? So you know, well, I just was going to go out and just use the standard color alphabet. There was no standard color alphabet, so I had to invent it. So again, this was a little while ago, so I invented the color alphabet. I chose colors based on my perception that I've got full color vision, and I used uh, the mapping of how often the letters turn out to be uh, in English, like the letter E is orange. I felt orange was the most easy to recognize color, and so I picked all the colors that were easiest to discern as the letters that were more frequent to occur, so that it would be easy to read this language. I really wanted this language to be legible. That was super important to me. Uh, unless you're a male, in which case one in ten men are colorblind and you can't read this language at all. But you're as well. So. so did you choose for AEIO, you know, the vowels, did you choose the more primary colors and the variations of those? Exactly. Instead of starting with the primary colors as A, you know, the vowels. Right, T and E are the most frequent letters in the alphabet. So I used E as orange, I is, the, is pure yellow, O is pure red, so exactly. I used the, the letters that are going to happen most often, I made them the most obvious uh, based on because we, as humans, are really bad at, at deciphering colors. We're really bad at, we don't have good color memory. We're not trained to remember colors. There's just so much, there's so many problems with color alphabet, there's no, there's no wonder why I couldn't find a standard, right, at the time. Did you patent the color alphabet? No, no, I actually gave it away for free online and let everyone use it, so, because that's just what I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to make it available, so I have a font that I developed for it, and I have a website where people can go type in stuff, download the font, and pretty much make uh, a book or use it. And I've had it used several times. <coughs> like for instance, a, a, a gentleman in England uh, created a book on, on text and actually used the color alphabet to not only put, you know, make the, the edge here so that it would actually save the name of the book and the, the author, but he used it throughout to show that fonts don't need to just be, you know, uh, black and white and shapes. They could actually think, you could think of them as color. And you can see how this is all following, right? We started with painting, and then we got fingers, we got crayons, now we have a color alphabet. Am I, like, am I taking you through this okay? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. So I created, I used that text uh, information. Uh, on the right is a picture of Euler, and I used the numbers from the resistors to create like uh, Euler's number. And so you kind of have this interlaced portrait of Euler, the mathematician, and his number that's named after him. Uh, for the series in the middle, I used uh, the names of girls or boys that were common in 1968 to create a, a series called the Lost Children series. Uh, where the text looked like little DNA sequences, but in actuality it was boys and girls names which you could read. And then finally I took it, I took it to the, the full length and I created a Hamlet piece, so it's Hamlet's soliloquy, to be or not to be, um, where a poem by Rilke was embedded in the piece so that it was a very romantic piece, and I thought a romantic poem would be really nice. So, and then this is a detail of that lost uh, Children's series, and you can, if you could read the color alphabet, you could read those names. I'm, and that's a close up of oil. And again, this is just the resistor stuff, so you get, this is standard, so everybody should go read. But then I thought, okay, well, this is a cool thing, I have it, I made it. I didn't have it, but like, nobody else is using it. So I might as well take it outside and start exploring uh, some ideas about like the color alphabet. And so I went ahead and I, so I made something, I started playing with encaustic again, but this time I incorporated the color alphabet as pangrams in the series. So I created 
a series where it kind of shows off the color alphabet. A pangram is a sentence that contains all the letters. So designers know that if you create a font, you kind of want to show off all those fonts. You don't want the letter Z kind of just not there. So you use something called a pangram to actually show yourself, you know, show it off. So I created an entire series called Pangram, and they looked gorgeous. I got the uh, Sherry Silver. So I also created a book uh, that I brought, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, it's by Wittgenstein, it's called Remarks on Color. Uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein is a philosopher, and this is an example of not only the, this is a handmade book, but this is also an example of how the text looks once you download it from the website and then incorporate it into something like, you know, a layout. And then finally, the mating jacket, which I did bring. Do you want to get it? Yeah, good. Um, I thought this was really fun. Um, after doing a lot of research on color, I found that men are more 1 in 10 likely to be colorblind, and women are only 1 in 100 likely. So I thought I'd play with the idea of the gender nature of color by creating a mating jacket that had come on, innuendos, like, hey baby, what's your sign? And I pasted, I actually wrote them all over this jacket. So that um, maybe I could like one day like walk into a bar and like. <laughs> but I don't think it was that successful. But you guys can tell me because here it is. <laughs> For whatever reason, nobody bought it. Thank <laughs> you. Oh. See, be able to read all this stuff. You know, I was playing with the idea of being a peacock, or you know, all these things that we think of in the color or in the world of like nature. Like women are able to see more colors, which is really cool, right? So I, again, I took the the idea of this color alphabet and took it and transcended it. And then there was what else? Where where else could I go with it? Well, so I decided. Well, oh, by the way, this is Hamlet the entirety on the left, and then this is the close up view. Which you could do from my website. So, but anyway, it's not in costume film. No, this is just printed on a printer paper. <laughs> but you can kind of see you can, you can still read it legibly. But that's what it was. It's in English. So I took it to the final conclusion here. And that was the last show we had, which was uh, um, the title paintings. Where I always have a problem as a painter, like trying to figure out what title should I call this. I don't want to be didactic. I don't want to call it. Apple One, or like, you know, Girl with a Bucket, or something, and it's Girl with a Bucket. Like, I want to be clever, but then too clever is not good either. So I thought, artists always have problems with titles. I spent like three months coming up with a hundred different titles, and then I just developed a set of rules with my color alphabet, knowing that I wouldn't have to paint a single painting. I would just use the rules. So here's an example of that rule. I spoke the titles out loud. Uh, this is a visual voice. Alphabet soup. Yeah, so I did that. Uh, and I was able to take that waveform and deconstruct it into the actual letters alphabet soup. And you can kind of see where the space is. I left it white. And then this is what that piece looks like. I didn't have to think about it. I, actually, the title was the piece. Right? And so we had an entire show, and of course Sherry was freaking out because I told her, no, you can't put the title into work. She's like, well, how's anybody supposed to actually buy that piece? Well, they can point at it, where they can tell you what the work is. And she's like, no, no, you don't have to make a key for it, Chris. I'm like, oh, okay, a key. So that's what I did. You can kind of see the little color uh, wheel key that I did, which is a color wheel alphabet. And it was great. A lot of people had a lot of fun trying to figure out what the titles were. Um, uh, during the opening, it was just amazing. I thought the, the, the gallery looked gorgeous like, because these pieces are just so beautiful and they're just automatic. Like, I didn't have to think about it. I love this series, right? A cue from Damien Hurst. Although it's still all encaustic and wax, so it's not just as easy as painting stripes. Encaustic is a labor, a, a, a huge labor. Uh, but if you want to see some of those works, this is formaldehyde cabbage. This is upside down. This is not formaldehyde cabbage. I always tell people, please don't hang stuff upside down. Um, and this one is a bird in a woman's hair. So these are some of the crazy cookie titles. One of the titles was like, this is not a vertical striped painting. And the other title was, this is not a horizontal striped painting, where they really were. So it gives us a title. 
Okay, I must have touched something. Let's see. Okay. So that brings us to the to today. I hope everyone's still engaging enough where you're not mm -hmm. you guys are standing, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I thought for this new body of work, I wanted I was inspired by the old masters. I had been thinking about like, okay, what do we do? Artists that are kind of stuck at a space and time where they're not sure what to go, where to go next. A lot of times they go back to the studio and they just start setting stuff up and photographing it. And that's like what the old masters did. When they were done, sometimes they would just kind of revert back and start stacking the stuff that they found. You know, skulls like they would have, I don't know, <laughs> which I have, I have no idea why, and I don't know who it is. Um, so I started stacking stuff and, and lighting things, and I just really fell in love with the process of just setting up the lights. It was so meditative. Uh, setting up the fruit or the objects and just photographing them. And I have thousands and thousands of photographs um, with the idea that I would then take them and translate them into the crayon. Um, I found that the what work that worked the best was the fruits. And so I started to tend less towards the skulls and the, the, the big lead pipe that I had were the glass weird beakers. I have tons of beakers. I have microscopes. I have like small dead animals. I've got everything in my studio, but if you were a kid, you'd love it. So, and then I started focusing on the fruit instead. And I took these objects, and you can kind of see, I have to really work. This is gorgeous, right? But when you take something and you reduce the number of pixels from 1900 across, 1900 pixels, to like 50, you tend to lose something, right? And that's the hardest part of this process was, how can I photograph this, crop it and compose it so that the, photo, the photographs would, you know, the images of the final pieces would do justice to the photographs, which is really difficult. So, this is my water. I really love these photos. I wish I was a photographer, though. But I didn't win any paper photography. So. <laughs> um, so, this is an example of the process. Uh, so, I have my map, I have my crayons, I've got my photograph, and then I can go to work and use how I did that with my videos. So, these are some, some examples of the nasty place that I have down in the basement. This is the peaches that I have, and you can see that each one of the peaches is indexed so that I know exactly what bucket to pick when I need it. So. And that's done with a computer? Uh, it is done in Photoshop, but I have to manually do it because this is not a rectilinear grid that I'm working with. It's a hexagonal grid, so I have developed a like, uh, square root of two thing that I use and the interlace thing that I use uh, to kind of get the pixels to be offset and also to be accurate. Because the more accurate you can be, you guys might not notice, but like, this is like one of the reasons I feel like I'm doing a good job at this and nobody's just like, oh, somebody's just for reprodu reproducing this work. No, it's like every pixel is super important. I make the casting exactly the right color and I make sure that it's exactly the right thing before I start. So, good question though. But yes, everything is, has to be done on the computer because once I've gone through the process, it's just so impossible. Uh, so, one of the cool things about encaustic, I brought this up originally, was that the fact that it can be molded as well as it uses paint, which is why this is kind of three-dimensional sculpture still. Uh, and specifically for this show, I really love the idea of deconstructing or removing the color from the surface of the actual fruit, which is what you see in the bowls, and actually putting them into uh, the crayons themselves, so kind of taking them off. Okay. And that brings us to the, almost the end of the talk. Because this is where the newest work is going. And maybe this will help you see where I am going next. Or maybe not, I have no idea where I'm going. But like, so, uh, these are the crayons that you see below you. But this is what we see when we melt the back. This is what's behind these crayons before I stick the fuse it. So watermelon, apple, and the banana, right? And it's gorgeous, and just you got to see it, me, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> so I really find, find this kind of just seductive and beautiful. I love the looseness, it's no control, but I really don't care because I'm just gonna stick something in it, so like, I don't care. Like, but then I started thinking, okay, maybe I should care, maybe I should start exploring that process, because this just looks so good. And so I use it as a screen, screen background. So I started with this piece back here, um, which we titled, Becoming, 
I don't know, we titled it in the day of the show. Um, where I dipped all my handmade crayons into the opposite color or to a, a complementary color, and then I physically put them on a board one by one. This is how intended I am. And I melted each one with a hot, um, what do you call it, soldering gun before I then took a blowtorch and an iron to the whole thing. Uh, and you can kind of see that's before, that's with the iron, and so the wax melted down. And then, um, that's a work in progress before the iron. And then from that, we got that. So you use the same length of crayons? I do. To, then, to create that? Right, and they melt down so that they're about, about half an inch or a quarter of an inch worth of pure wax. I then have to scrape it back with a giant razor blade, the whole surface, to get it to be flush, but it reveals the crayons and then all the imperfections, and it keeps the surface really smooth, just like the, these are also the same way. They've been razor bladed, so it's a beautiful, smooth surface. But how do you not prevent the, uh, the colors from mixing and muddying the clarity of the picture? Uh, I, I pray. <laughs> I got in. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I melt them very carefully with a yeah. blowtorch, but I guess it's just practice. I mean, they do muddy. And from my point of view, if you had seen this as a crayon work, it would have been a plane in my basement. Along with that, which is near, we're really close to the end, um, I just wanted just to kind of end off with the idea that it's all about play for me. I mean, the materials, the location, you know, for me, our being an artist is, is failing continuously. There's no such thing as success, because success just is a place where you stop. I want to continue to fail. So I want all the works to not be perfect enough. I don't want to be happy with where I am. I want to be someplace in the future. But I know that the work is interesting, um, and hopefully you can appreciate the work as it stands. But from my point of view, I've moved on. And so um, I do want to just kind of like say, hey, this is like, this is, uh, you know, this is what I do, I play. Um, I have a 3D printer through the university, so I printed a ton of chairs. I don't know why. Um, uh, uh, here's an example. Um, I think they're gorgeous, and I'm not sure what that's going to be. And uh, <laughs> I also printed, I also designed a ton of, of printable furniture along with a guy. And they animated it, so I thought that would be fun too. So maybe an animation is in the future, um, but I have no idea. So, but I wanted to show you that like it doesn't matter what you do, you just like have to have fun with the art, um, because that's what art should be. It should not be something that's serious. So thanks everybody. Wow.